I'm Dr. Gwen, and my channel is all about creating content that empowers the neurodiverse and disabled community. In this episode, Dr. Gary Edding, who is a developmental optometrist, comes on the show to help us understand how significant the visual system is to our everyday life. For example, did you know that there's a difference between seeing clearly and what the brain does with visual information? Or that two-thirds of the inputs coming into the brain are visual, which is more than the inputs from all the other sensory systems combined. This is so cool. To learn out more about the visual system, stay tuned. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Gary Edding, developmental optometrist extraordinaire. Hi, Gary. How are you? I'm great, Gwyneth. How are you? So good. Thank you so much for um, coming on the show. I can't wait to actually talk about vision and visual processing. But before we get there, maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I've been practicing in this field for over almost 50 years. Our practice is a site for seven different externships, seven different optometry schools. I've been fortunate to lecture not only throughout the United States at different congresses, but also in many uh, areas uh, around the world, including Australia and uh, Spain and, and different parts of Europe. Uh, I got into this field because I unknowingly had a, an undetected visual problem. I was in my fourth year of optometry school and I attended a vision and learning workshop at UCLA. And one of the speakers was a developmental optometrist and he started talking about symptoms of uh, children and adults that had undetected visual problems. And I thought, he's talking about me. Uh, I'd always been a good athlete. I'd always enjoyed reading, but I'd always felt that I wasn't very smart because I had to work two or three, four times as hard as everyone else to get good grades and it took me a long time to learn things and retain things. And of course, when I realized that I had this problem, I was pretty uh, upset because I wanted all those Friday nights and Saturday nights back when everybody else was having a great old time and I was in my room studying. So that's how I kind of gravitated to working in this particular field. Mm, that's, a, that's amazing. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting because we, and this is exactly why I love that, you know, you agreed to come on the show. You would never probably think that, you know, because you're a good athlete, because you're a good student, because you can read, you never think that you'd have a visual issue. Um, and so this is, this is great. So, um, Gary, maybe what you, if you could actually help the audience understand, um, what is vision? Okay, that's an excellent uh, way to start uh, because there's two terms that are used interchangeably that mean really very different uh, things. And in order for us to have a conversation, we have to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So we can drop down our little... Uh, our little our little visual here for and, everyone to see. And so if people are looking at this picture, uh, I typically ask them, well, what do you see? And a common response is dots and splotches. Maybe out of a, an audience of 30 or 40 people, I might have 5% of the people that will actually see what's in the picture. And so I will narrow down my uh, question by saying, it's a farm animal. And of course, then we're gonna get an aha. More and more people are gonna find it, but there's still gonna have, still be a number of people where they're not gonna be able to see it until we literally trace over the picture with our finger for the audience to see that it is in fact a cow. Now I kind of take delight when I'm doing this uh, lecture live by holding this picture and walking up to the people that have glasses and having them take a good look at it. And they wave their heads and they don't know what they see. Uh, but basically this points out a fundamental difference between eyesight, how clearly you see something and vision, which is the ability to understand what you see. Now, if you had never seen a cow before, naturally you wouldn't be able to see a cow in this picture. And that points out a very profound uh, piece of information about vision. And that is that vision is learned. 
Now, no two people learn vision at the same rate or to the same degree. But unlike walking and talking, there's no way to know you as a person are learning to do it right. And for a parent, unless they've had an older child observing their child, they themselves may not know that there's any particular difficulty going down, going on. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news is, is that because vision is learned, it can be developed. Now, in the 40s, there was a significant book released by Dr. Arnold Gazelle called Vision, Its Development, an Infant and Child. And in that book, they went and they described the whole vision development process. But more importantly, they their study that visual readiness in the 40s really didn't take place in terms of really visual readiness to learn to read really wasn't in place until six and a half or seven years of age. Six and a half being you know, closer to the ladies and because uh, the boys uh, matured a little later, eight, seven years old. And that was when development was much more experiential than it is now. And in those particular days, and I come from those days because I went to kindergarten in the early 50s, uh, no one was teaching reading in kindergarten because they understood this. Well, yeah. today, we're now introducing reading not only in kindergarten in some places, but in some places, uh, even nursery schools are starting to get into the act. So we're ignoring uh, a large body of, audio, uh, of uh, evidence that suggests that, you know, if you're not going to, if you're going to introduce reading too early, you're running the risk of actually uh, creating more problems than uh, you're going to successfully address. And part of this is because my generation uh, went to college and we all found that unless you got an advanced degree, you weren't going to be able to get a good job. So the parents of that generation have all this angst about the futures of their children. So they thought that starting earlier and doing everything earlier and earlier was going to be better. And yet what we're finding is we're finding more and more children younger and younger running into difficulties in school, not because they weren't visually ready, but because they were asked to do things that they weren't visually and developmentally ready to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that is, you know, and Gary, do you find, I mean, this idea here that I love this, the difference between eyesight and vision and eyesight, I think for many people, we understand that really to be that 2020 vision chart test that, you know, everyone does, you know, pretty quickly. And unfortunately, Versus, oh, yeah, okay. I, go ahead, Gary. That is the primary vision testing that a significant number of children in the United States have prior to entering kindergarten. There are really only two states that mandate that a child has to have a comprehensive vision exam before they enter kindergarten. And in those states, the research is showing that 18 to 20% of those kids have visual problems. So mm. we have a lot of children that are looking forward to starting school and happy about learning, and yet they have these undetected problems that could have been picked up many times in just a, uh, a good formal comprehensive vision exam. And because the parents have been assured that the, guy, the child is seeing clearly in the distance, the parents don't bother to take their child to a vision specialist to have their eyes checked. Yeah, it, it honestly, I mean, Gary, if it wasn't for what I do, I don't think I'd even know. I wouldn't even know, you know, there's a difference for those of you out there between develop and developmental optometrist and a, and a general optometrist, um, you know? And so this is, this is important because really it is about what the brain makes of what is coming in, right? And that the visual system is so complex and is part of the brain. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Two thirds of all the neuro information that's being processed at any one time is visual. There's more area of the brain dedicated to vision than all the other uh, sensory systems combined. We have six eye muscles that control uh, the movements of each eye. Those have to be integrately synchronized. We have two visual systems in each eye, one that's involved with seeing fine detail and the other that's involved with having uh, 
good peripheral vision and balance. And if all these systems aren't working right, the uh, likelihood of there being a problem is really significant. Yep. Yep. And it's, it's, you know, I think the other piece here too is it's not volitional, meaning it's not controlled per se, right? It's really based on how the brain is, is kind of reflexively, if you will, um, responding to the information. So, you know, I think that's why we, we don't understand fully the impact and the role of the visual system on our everyday functioning, I mean, especially for students who are learning. But um, like you said, like you're a good student, you read, you were a great athlete, still didn't think that there were visual problems that you might've had. Um, well, one of the problems you know. that we've run into is that the old model that the eye is is a camera has has done serious damage to this information because yeah. everybody thought, everybody assumes that everybody sees things exactly the same way when in fact that's not true i mean the eye just receives the light and we know now that when you shine light into the eye over almost 35 different areas of the brain can light up and not all the information that goes into the eye goes to the visual part of the brain, which is in the, in the in what we call the occipital lobe. In fact, 20% of that information goes to an area that is in the, you know, is really in the midbrain, which is involved with posture and balance and orientation. And that's why people that are clumsy, people that have difficulty with coordination and moving through space, very frequently, the reason is they have uh, an undetected visual problem. So, so Gary, let's get into that a little bit, actually, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the common, um, things that happen that people kind of just kind of write off like, ah, they're just clumsy. Ah, they just, you know, oh, they're just a slow reader. Ah, like, you know, what are some of those things? All right. Well, uh, common symptoms of a, of a lot of the people that we see are, well, if I want to fall asleep, I just read a book. I can't find my, once I go into a, a mall, I can't find my car. Uh, I have difficulty driving at night. I get overwhelmed easily. I can't uh, do more than one thing at the same time. Uh, I have difficulty uh, grasping math concepts or I can't even dress myself to the, you know, which involves visualization. In other words, someone ha is over almost overwhelmed by going shopping for themselves because unless they actually try the clothes on, mm -hmm. they have no idea whether or not that picture in their head matches what they look like with their uh, clothes going on. I mean, we, I mean, being uh, put on, I mean, we see athletes that are, uh, performing at a fairly high level, but not at a high enough level in order to be uh, successful in their particular sport. We have people that have head injuries that after the head injury, suddenly their executive function starts to uh, deteriorate. They have difficulty uh, with too much information. Their, yeah. their thinking process uh, slows down. Yeah. There, I mean, there's just so many symptoms. A lot of people have motion sickness. And, yep. you know, just from being on a boat, but just in, in any number of uh, conditions. But people get headaches uh, when they try to do uh, close work for any period of time or they can't read for long periods of time. I mean, those are yeah. just... Uh, a few of the broad categories because we receive uh, referrals from a broad range of uh, professions because vision is a total body kind of thing. When oh, we, I love that. When, we when we're looking at something, like if I'm looking at a dog, I not only know that it's a dog visually, but from my prior experience, I know what it feels like. I know what it smells like. And if I was real little and I had a dog at home, I may even know what it tastes like. Yeah. All that information <laughs> is integrated with the visual process. And so a an environment, a home environment, and by the way, we found that it's not tied to economic, socioeconomics, but if a child is not raised in, a, in an environment where they're given the opportunity to really explore and use their vision, 
they're not going to have nearly the information stored in their visual computer mm-hmm. that somebody else that's had a rich environment. And so that's one of the challenges that used to be addressed with nursery school. In other words, if a child was raised in a family where both parents were working or both parents didn't have a a strong educational background, they could put the child in nursery school and nursery school would provide them meaningful opportunities for a lot of these visual abilities that are learned to be developed to virtuosity. But now many nursery schools are now becoming more academic and assuming that the child coming in there already has had these meaningful experiences. So we're having more and more children where the, they have large gaps in their vision development. And as a result, when they are introduced to reading, they struggle. Yeah. 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 And, you know, Gary, in regards to treatment, because, um, being able to identify or be curious about how your brain works for yourself. Obviously, it's a very private individual experience, but there's obviously hope here because, I mean, this is where you really come in. It's, it's yes, in identifying out of this very complex system, what is happening for this person? Um, because it can be very different for everybody. You know, maybe one system um, the, the fine, the, the fine detail system versus the peripheral system or that, you know, I mean, uh, you, you kind of figure out what exactly is happening in this very complex system, but then what is intervention? You know, what is intervention doing? How does it treat or change what's happening, you know, meaningfully for a person? Well, I think we, we pretty much have to back up. Dentistry's done a real good job in educating the public how important it is to have regular dental appointments. I mean, children are going to the dentist sometimes as early as six months of age. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't done quite as good a job stressing the importance of children being seen early for vision evaluation, simply to not only rule out the presence of an optical problem, which is really quite rare, but more importantly, to empower parents to know whether or not their child is child's vision is developing as it should. I mean, I it would be much more cost effective and beneficial for me to just see ch- patients yearly when they're young and, and advise parents what they can do to enrich the environment so the meaningful experiences can uh, be presented than to have to formally provide treatment to help develop those abil- abilities that weren't uh, adequately addressed. But there is treatment for these problems, but the earlier we find these particular problems, the simpler those uh, treatment options are. I mean, when we see them really young, uh, for example, one tip off that a child may have some visual issues is their lack of interest in doing puzzles. Well, puzzles are the early foundation of form perception. And if you can't tell the difference between a circle and an oval, and a square and a rectangle, how are you going to be able to discriminate those curly Q lines that go to make up letters, that go to make up words, that go to make up sentences, that go to make up paragraphs that stand for abstract ideas? So just by specifically assigning activities for the parents to do at home to help develop the mastery when they're young, oftentimes is sufficient to avoid the development of what we call vision development problems. There are two kinds of problems that we see. One are where we have a child that's entering school, being introduced to reading and does not have the visual readiness skills to learn to read. And then the other broad category is those people that have developed those abilities well enough to read, but they haven't developed the proficiency in those abilities to be able to do it quickly, comfortably, accurately and for extended periods of time. And that group we start to see around the third grade. But it's not unusual for us to see that throughout people's lives because these problems you don't outgrow. Mm -hmm. All you do is practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes more ingrained bad habits. So we can see adults that have had these problems their whole life. And The way they have successfully navigated the world is they've read as little as possible. They've studied with other people. They've developed 
good auditory learning skills and they have avoided professions many times that involve a lot of reading. Mm. Wow. Right. We come, we, and like, and that's like a slow thing. Like it's compensatory. You know, we naturally compensate, um, to make do. And we, it's like, it's like a creep. It's like a slow creep over time that like, it's not like, oh, I have a visual processing issue. So, you know, I'm going to not choose this for these professions. It's just, oh, that was hard. That's kind of naturally hard for me. So I, I just steer away from it. Like, you know, just naturally, right? Without kind of thinking about, oh, I wonder if there is something here, you know? Absolutely. And, and again, uh, when people, one of the most common reasons that a professional or a parent comes into our office is because the child is not achieving up to their potential. Yep. A, a child that's been identified as gifted, the assumption is they couldn't have a visual problem, which couldn't be mm. further from the or, truth. Yeah. But because they are bright, oftentimes they're able to compensate for it. But if you have a visual problem and you try hard and it doesn't get better, one of the conclusions you can come to, especially if you're smart, is either A, I hate it, meaning I hate reading, or even more significantly, maybe I'm not as smart as my parents think I am, in which case we now start to have self-esteem issues starting uh, to come in. And yet the poor child, they tried, it didn't get better. They're labeled as being lazy or not applying themselves. And it becomes a whole other, you know, you know, bag of worms, so to speak, a can of worms. Bag, can, it's all bad. Bucket, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all bad, right, Gary? I love that you're bringing up the emotional pieces because really, you know, we, we put so much um, value in intellect that we don't, you know, the other pieces in that I see too, Gary, is we might not be achieving to the potential that we, that we really believe this person can achieve or they are spending so much effort to do something that we imagine would be easy for them, right? That's another thing. Like um, whenever I'm working with clients that have learning disabilities, one of the most common complaints is, why is it easier for everyone else? Like well, I look around and it's so much easier for everyone. I can achieve what they're achieving. Sometimes, you know, even in these great ways, but it just takes me so much longer with so much more work. You know, that for me typically is like that's a tip off too, that there's something potentially happening there, that kind of private experience of that. But I love that you highlighted the emotional piece, you know, that um, what's left? Oh, I'm lazy, unmotivated, and I'm really actually not as smart as people think I am. That could be internal or that could be external. Gosh, you're so you're 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 so smart, you just don't apply yourself. Oh, you're so smart, you just don't work hard enough. Oh, you're so right. So, I love that you're bringing this up. Um cuz you know, that does nothing good for anybody. Um that that just does does no good actually. So, so Gary, like um is there hope here? <laughs> You know, what you said, which is so interesting is, yes, you compensate, um, but you just kind of like practice doesn't necessarily change the brain's way of understanding the visual information, right? So what is, so what, what can help the brain then, then do that differently or maybe even build, you know, additional pathways maybe? Well, one of the tools we have, I mean, we have several tools to work with these problems. And again, it depends on how early we're able to address them. Uh, for some children, it's a matter of advising the parents to wait a year before they start kindergarten to just make sure that everything uh, develops to where it should be. Another option we have is sometimes we use what we call performance glasses or their glasses, uh, mild magnifying glasses that fool the visual system into thinking what they're what it's looking at when the child's holding a book up close is further away and a little bit bigger, which reduces the amount of physical effort they have to dedicate to focusing their eyes when they look at the printed page. But again, when we see children that have had longstanding problems, then what we need to do is we need to basically help them learn 
to use their visual system in a more efficient way. And we do that through a process that we call optometric vision therapy, which really is visual brain retraining because we're not training eye muscles to be strong because the eye muscles are 100 times stronger than they need to be. But rather, we're trying to help someone develop proficiency in all these visual abilities so that they can all be done on automatic. Mm -hmm. I use the example of learning to drive a car. When you first learn to drive a car, you're thinking about you got to put one hand here and one hand at here, and you got to look in this mirror and this mirror and this mirror and don't talk to me and the radio's off and it's very stressful. And then yeah. now you know, we drive a car and we've got two fingers on the wheel, unfortunately, sometimes, and we're singing along to the radio. We're telling our kids to stop hitting each other in the back seat. And we're thinking about what we're going to cook for dinner. And yet, if something unusual happens on the road, we're actually able to respond quicker with greater efficiency than we would have way back when, when we were first learning to drive a car. In other words, all visual abilities need to be on autopilot. Now, what are these visual abilities? Well, we first have to have competency in eye movements. Uh, you have to be able to follow a moving target easily and effortlessly without moving your head and to be able to do it without consciously thinking about it. Following eye movements uh, or lack of competency in them is usually commonly associated with eye-hand coordination problems, problems coloring inside the lines, problems with handwriting, problems reproducing what is being seen, problems walking in a straight line. Uh, then there are tracking eye movements. When we read, we don't make smooth movements across the page. We make these little hops with our eyes. Well, if you're not able to accurately move your eyes from one point to another, uh, you're gonna skip words when you read. You may even skip lines when you read. You may transpose words because you may go too far and then have to come back. And so was becomes saw and on becomes no. You may need to use your finger to keep your place. Copying from the board might take you a long period of time and you may leave out things simply because of the lack of ease. Your reading is not gonna be very quick either. And it's not uncommon that you may call the same word several different things in the, in the same paragraph simply because you do not always land on the same part of the word when you're going through the book. And then we have eye teaming skills. I talked to you about how complex uh, the visual system is, six eye muscles that are controlled by three nerves in each eye, they all have to work together. So if you have eyes that don't wanna work together well, uh, even though the brain is sending the message for them to do so, it's kind of like trying to get two horses that don't like each other to pull a wagon in a straight line. And that's where we run into this problem where the more they pull on those horses, the more they try to focus their eyes, the more the eyes want to go out. And that's why after a while, they don't want to try anymore. Mm -hmm. If they're putting all their effort into trying to keep their eyes pointed at the same place or keep those horses moving in the same direction, they're not paying attention to the scenery that the horses are moving through. And that's how a vis undetected visual problem can affect comprehension, for example. This effort that goes into uh, just trying to keep the horses going in a straight line can also cause headaches. It can cause eye strain. It can cause eye fatigue. Many people that have these difficulties also are sometimes labeled as having attentional problems. Now, we do not teach. I mean, we do not train or treat attentional you know, problems, ADHD or ADD, but many of our patients when we remove the visual problem, no longer exhibit those problems. So it's not that the die, you know, that uh, I treated ADHD, but rather ADHD in that particular case was not due to uh, a, a, you know, a neuro, a, meta, a metabolic problem or a neurological problem. Just mm -hmm. like you can have an auditory processing problem that can also cause attentional problems. Yep. And yep. all these abilities, you can learn to do them on a, in a more efficient way. And it's not dependent on age. The good news is, is that the brain is plastic. About half our patients and the patients that many of our colleagues are seeing in their office are adults. 
And of course, adults, when they have this problem and know there's something to do about it, they're really, really excited because for many of them, it's kept them from pursuing a career they wanted to go into or enjoying books they may want to read or even cause them a lot of anxiety because they were afraid that somebody was going to call them on it one day. You know, like an attorney that would have to read a brief uh, in between, uh, you know, between lunch and coming back into court and is such a slow reader that they would never get through the material. Yeah. Yes. And and like Gary, the, the retraining, um, what does that look like from a practical standpoint? You know, especially, you know, I, I love that you highlighted that, you know, the brain is plastic throughout life. And so you don't have to be a kiddo in order to benefit from vision therapy. Um, but what, what does therapy actually look like? Um, if, if someone were like, Oh, I, I, I'm kind of interested, but what's that commitment? You know, I know it depends on what, what's happening, but in general. All right. I mean, that's really a good idea. First of all, someone has to have a need for us to offer the option of pursuing the vision therapy. Right. Typically the way we provide vision therapy in our office and, and, uh, different offices do it in different ways. We typically see people once weekly. They come in for a 50 minute session. If they're tiny people, four or five years old, and and usually that population has crossed eyes or lazy eyes. That those are the ones that we see that young with that area. Uh, But most of the time we're seeing them for 50 minutes once a week. And we assign 24 minutes of daily drills for them to uh, work on. And again, to use a real oversimplification, let's let's say that someone has difficulty with following ability. And by the way, we work with the whole visual system and there's like, depending on who you're talking to, you you can have uh, 20, 30 visual abilities. Uh, So we're working on the whole process but there are, you know, a vision is an emergent of all these abilities, but let's say we're talking about a following eye movement. Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, we're going to have the person is just going to be, their job is going to be to just follow a moving target with their head still breathing nice and relaxed, being aware of the rest of the room. In other words, every skill that we help the patient learn, they have to learn with minimal amount of energy expenditure. So initially, we just want them to be able to learn to move their eyes free of their head. And that's a, de- you know, developmentally, you, by the time you're introduced to reading, you should be able to move your eyes free of your head because a, a head weighs pounds and an eye weighs ounces. So it's not a very efficient thing to be moving your head. And when you move your head, you bring in the vestibular system, you bring the vestibular system in, then you're dealing with balance and everything mm-hmm. else. So mm-hmm. once they can, once they can effortlessly follow, then we introduce, and again, we're using different techniques, so it's not the same technique, but then we'll introduce talking. So in other words, they have to have a conversation while they're doing the task. So they got to talk, answer questions while they're doing it. Then we may have them walking in time to a beat, like a metronome, and talking, and looking at the target as they're moving. In other words, we try to help them to develop the degrees of freedom that that skill is going to function no matter how much visual stress we put on them. And we do that same thing with tracking, with changing focus, judging where things are, peripheral vision, depth perception, knowing where they are in space. All these activities we do this, you know, we, we help them develop it. And it, it's the therapy involves feedback. In other words, we're asking them to be aware. What are you doing? What does it feel like when you're looking close? What does it feel like when you're looking far away? So we're working on their ability to attend to small details, mm-hmm. which generalizes, of course, in their ability to visually discriminate finer differences and yeah. pay attention to detail. So we're working and, and, and what happens is it we start from very large movements to more discrete movements, which require much greater com- 
you know, uh, concentration and control. Mm -hmm. And typically a pro, you know, we, every two weeks we change the drills that are done at home. And every 12 weeks we typically check our patients and a typical program is about a six month program. That's a typical program. Uh, we see a lot of patients that are on the aut autism spectrum. And in those particular cases, the program may take longer if we feel that we can, in fact, provide more, you know, benefit to the child and the parents feel that they want us to continue working with them. With our mm -hmm. athletes, it's about a six month program with our post concussive patients. It may take longer depending on uh, how severe that is. And we also work with, uh, you know, people that have had strokes. And of course, that is going to take a little longer. The children and adults we work with that have a crossed eye or have reduced sight in one eye, that typically can take, you know, six months to a year. But the nice thing about our treatment typically is that our patients start to experience changes six to 12 weeks after we start. Mm. So that, so for the parents, oftentimes, because we're the last people seen after they've gone everywhere else, uh, it, it's a real uh, reassuring and, and really exciting for them to see that things are happening relatively quickly. And, and because many times we're seeing a child and that child has been told things were going to get better over and over again. And it really doesn't believe me because I'm just an old guy with no hair uh, <laughs> for them to suddenly find that things are getting better relatively uh, quickly is, you know, it's really exciting, you know, for them to see. Yeah. You know, I, I love, I, there's so many pieces that you're, you're just bringing up here that, you know, I can't help, but, um, it, it resonates with me psychologically, right? The idea of um, uh, this this idea of cognitive resourcing. You know, if we have to spend all of our effort on just figuring out what the letters are, what is left for comprehension? Like, you know, that's what I see a lot of times, right? I'm spending all this time on decoding, figuring out what the, the word is. Not, no, no wonder you have nothing left to understand what you just read, right? And so this idea and that the intervention itself is really about um, fluency, what we would call like fluency or efficacy, where the brain, it becomes automatic and then it frees your brain up. Like everyone has a limited amount of resourcing, but it frees the brain up then to do other important things like learning or interacting with others um, or um, building a new skill, right? I love that you brought up in a low stress way. Like you mentioned that, you know, this idea of, I want you to be able to do this with the minimal expenditure, meaning I, I, I there's not, I, I'm not going to, we don't want this to be so demanding that this is all your brain can think about. We want it to be so easy for your brain that it releases you and frees you up for other things. And I think just psychologically, everyone knows that experience of going into something that's very challenging or difficult. You know, you're talking about an adult reading out loud and how, that's really hard for a lot of people. Um, you know, you lay, you, did the anxiety come first or did the reading problem come first? <laughs> I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like what came first? It's like so interesting to me. Um, but you're right. This is like the last intervention that usually people think about. And by that time, people are so disillusioned by intervention by then. Absolutely. Well, you know, yeah. coming back to the point that you made about the psychological effect, <clears throat> There's a physiological reason why uh, we're stressing this relaxed breathing and being aware of your peripheral vision. And that's really because when you're under stress, your dynamic peripheral vision shrinks. Mm, when you have high anxiety, your peripheral vision shrinks. And for some people, it can get to the point where it's is you know it's almost like looking through a straw. So it is no surprise that these people can't go into crowded places and can't go into crowded rooms, because the way they're looking at that room is they're looking at that room through two straws, not looking at it as a big screen. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier that there are two visual systems in uh, each eye. 
Uh, there's one that's involved with acuity and color and detail. And then there's one, and then there's the other system, which is involved with peripheral vision and balance. Children that are on the autism spectrum, interestingly, try sometimes to use the peripheral system to see clearly with. And those are the kids that you notice when they look at things. Yeah. They're turning their head or they're the child that is sitting there and so absorbed in doing this. That's the child that is stuck in the central system that only sees letters and numbers and colors and fine detail. And then you have the other one that is everything has equal stimulus value where they're stuck in the peripheral visual system. So what we oftentimes are doing in vision therapy is helping them relearn how to integrate those two systems. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of elements in culture that are uh, working against this, staring at cell phones, staring at, at computers all day long, staring at iPads, which are encouraging people to use the central part of their vision and not use their uh, dynamic peripheral vision. And yep. we are seeing, and as I, I'm sure you are too, more and more patients that have as one of their diagnoses, anxiety. And we're able oh, yeah. to confirm like an, as simple a task as having a child following a moving target. I will say to them, while you're watching the target, can you see anything else in the room? And oftentimes they'll say no. In other words, they have literally following the target like this and not taking in the whole particular room. So needless to say, the world is going to be a very, very stressful place for them. Sure. Yeah. I don't understand what's happening or I'm overwhelmed. But I would say if everything has equal value, if we're looking at something with everything is equal value, that already stress. I like, don't just thinking about that stresses me out, you know, um, because we have to make choices and, uh, you know, about what we're paying attention to. We can't pay attention to everything and be overloaded and overwhelmed. But I love all these pieces, um, Gary. I think it's just so important for people to understand um, how important the sensory systems are, you know, and, and I, I honestly feel like the visual system really gets lost um, in the mix. We take it for granted and we don't realize how um, important and how much the brain relies on, on, on vision uh, to well, function. Our visual, system, our visual system steers us through life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's basically what it does. Yeah. So, and uh, if you're not able to move your eyes smoothly, yeah, you're not going to be able to move smoothly. You're going to look for that cup of water. You're not going to hit that cup of water. Yeah. I mean, so the, the great irony is if you were to ask a hundred people consecutively, what sense they would fear to lose the most, they'll all say vision, <laughs> but those same people only will go and have their vision checked if they have a headache or they have an eye infection uh, rather than going uh, simply to make sure that they have the equipment to be able to compete in the game. Yes, yes. And, oh, and, my and gosh. The, and and so the people that are the most successful are the people that have the best visual software. And that's really what we're testing when we do our visual evaluation. In other words, our visual, yes. our visual examination not only includes looking for eye health, issues and making sure that the patient is seeing clearly and what looks like a comprehensive primary care vision exam. But we're also asking the question, does this person have the visual tools they need to meet the visual demands in their, in their environment and for the cognitive ability that they have? Someone that has average visual abilities and is cognitively average is not going to have as big a challenge in life as somebody that has great cognitive ability and yet has average visual abilities. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that matchup because that does, that makes sense. Right. I mean, this is where we kind of determine potential, um, and, and seeing discrepancies between the functioning piece and that potential piece. Um, that's a real, that's really sophisticated. That's kind of a, this a nuance that I think gets missed. Um, you know, Gary, if someone's listening to this and they're like, oh my goodness, like, I, I, I got to learn more about this. What's a, what's a, a resource um, you could recommend? Obviously, you know, talking to a, a professional, a developmental optometrist specifically, I would say. But what's a good resource people can go to in order to either find a developmental optometrist by them or find out more about this? Okay, there, there are a number of great options. Uh, there's an organization that certifies doctors, in this particular uh, field of optometry, it's called the College of Optometrists in Vision Development. The acronym is COVD, and COVD.org has a wonderful website with an abundance of uh, literature. It has a locate a doctor uh, section where you can find doctors all over the world that do this a website that I'm a part of, visionhelp.com, has a library of uh, information on a wide variety of topics, including the role of vision and learning. Our office has a website, I mean, uh, visualprocessing.com. And I mean, those, those are good places to start. I mean, if they were going to make a, a they were going to make an appointment, um, there's questions that they need to ask if they're going to make an appointment in a particular doctor's office. They have to ask, does the, does the doctor examine children? Does the doctor do visual perceptual or visual processing testing? Does mm -hmm. the doctor report, does doctor uh, provide treatment for conditions? And lastly, does the doctor provide a report? Mm -hmm. Those are all great good, questions. All good screenings to find someone that specializes in this area. And by yeah. the way, not, I, when people ask me all the time, because we're primarily a referral practice, people will say, well, does everyone that comes to your office need vision therapy. And I, I say, well, first of all, I'm a referral office. But if you took 100 people that would come into my office that just came in randomly, we would probably find eight to 10 people that would have undetected visual problems like we're discussing. If we were to go into a classroom where kids are struggling with learning, we may see 50 to 60%. If we're looking at a population of kids that have been identified as having attentional problems, uh, there was a study done about 25 years ago that found about 30% of that population may have undetected visual problems. So we are going to find a lot of, you know, the important thing is to start early and, and have your child seen regularly to rule out that these problems don't necessarily occur. I mean, that's, that's the ideal. Yeah. And again, uh, the younger we see people, the easier it is for us to, um, you know, help them get on the right path. Yep. Yep. Yes. If anyone's listening to this, you know, and, and Gary just gave, um, three really good resources, including his own um, website. I'll put that those in the show notes in the description, depending on where you're listening or seeing this. Um, you know, at minimum, getting an evaluation is where to start, right? Um, getting evaluated specifically in visual, pro like this visual processing piece is, is where to start. Gary, do you find that insurance companies um, are, are you, people are able to get this through their insurance companies? I think it, it, it varies. Okay. These visual problems that I've discussed, we're not talking about visual processing problems, but we're talking about the... Uh, neuromuscular problems that I discussed earlier, those are medical diagnoses. So oftentimes the fact that they're medical diagnoses means that they, you know, the, the exact evaluation can be reimbursed 
in some cases by insurance. The visual mm -hmm. processing area varies. I mean, in our office, about up to 25% of our patients are receiving some kind of reimbursement mm -hmm. in this particular area, but it, it, but it varies because the, the insurance companies, if they feel that it has anything to do with education, they view it as educational and therefore they're not going to reimburse it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And I know that you do have... Yeah. I know that you also do work with some school districts in regards to, um, you know, uh, getting services, educational serve. I mean, like where it impacts a student educationally that some, some districts, um, through IEPs are able to also seek vision therapy services as well. Right. That, that is, that, that is true. And that that's happening. Uh, I know it's happening in our state, Significant California, everybody. Yeah. For those of you who are listening outside of California, where Gary and I are in California. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, thank you so much. You are always like, I always learn whenever I spend time with you, you broaden and make my understanding of things more robust. And I, I'm so appreciative to you in the field and for those of you that don't know Gary, he is a, a real, when I said extraordinary, he is, um, he's a real pillar in, in our community. And so, um, you know, people know to go to Gary, to, to Dr. Edding. So, um, I'm so appreciative that you spent time with us today here. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. Well, thank you, Gwen. And I, and I hope the work that you're doing is going to really end the, the senseless struggle that so many parents are going through trying to help their, their children. It shouldn't be that a parent's job is to find the professional. They should have other professionals that are guiding them. And I think you might be the missing piece to help uh, bridge that gap. Oh, thanks, Gary. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Be well. Bye-bye.